When the volcano erupted, we were actually at the launch of the plastics documentary and my role in emergencies is very much dependent on the type of emergency. And so as soon as I knew something had happened, I was on alert because I thought I might be called in. Uh, shortly after we left the Governor General's house, the phone went and um, I'd been called to one of the first meetings. In those sorts of situations, all of government gets called in and if they need some technical support, I might be invited to those groups. In this case, it was quite interesting because obviously I'm not a volcano expert, um, but my role was really to translate some of the information that was coming from the brilliant GNS volcano scientists into a form that was more useful for the police and the search and rescue people and the special forces. So because I was privy to all the meetings where decisions were being made and because one of the factors was the chance of the volcano erupting, there was um, a science communication role, I guess, in a rather extreme situation to try and connect the expert understanding of the volcano to the expert knowledge about going into dangerous places. The first I heard about the eruption was uh, driving back from Rotorua to Topo and we were out there for a meeting and uh, I received a phone call from, from someone in our team saying, hey, an eruption um, seems to have occurred at, at White Island and, um, and, and we're trying to, to make sure that we, we understand what's been happening down there. So the initial step was to go back to the office um, and, 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 um, and coordinate the initial response, the science response, uh, issuing what we call a volcanic alert bulletin. Um, stating that the alert level at the volcano had been raised, um, alerting everyone that an eruption had occurred. And then from that point onwards, it was very much around trying to understand how best we could assist the operations um, in Fakatani and also at the national level. I was suddenly asked by our team to go straight into the police control centre where they were operating basically the helicopter observation and rescue from, and it, it was a, you know, a really a fronting sight. It was a clear a tragedy was unfolding. After initial work on the day of the eruption in Rotorua, I moved down to Wellington and acted as GNS Science and our Volcano Monitoring Group's liaison in at the Beehive in the, in the bunker with Juliet Gerard and with, uh, with Norm, the head of uh, the National Emergency Management Agency. I'm the Director of Civil Defence Emergency Management, which is a statutory role in the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act provides responsibilities, uh, duties and powers in states of emergency, but it's broadly across risk reduction, readiness, response and recovery for any emergency that could impact New Zealand. And right now we're down here in the National Crisis Management Centre. It's in the basement of the Beehive in Wellington. This centre is here ready to be activated at any time and it provides for a multi-agency environment where we can work with the emergency services, other government agencies, but also lifeline utilities um, and other core agencies that might need to be involved down here to provide that direct support to New Zealanders. I initially met Juliet at uh, the police uh, response briefing uh, in Wellington at police headquarters and her job was clearly to uh, bring science together and make sure the best science advice was communicated as clearly as possible to support the decisions that had to be made at government. So we were working together to uh, get that science together, make it clear and, and provide it in a way that decision makers um, were crystal clear on, on, I guess, what was happening in the volcano and what, and what the probability of an eruption might be. I guess it was the most extreme example of having to learn a discipline that wasn't my home turf to very quickly activate networks that I had and connect with enough people to really make sure my understanding of what was going on was sound and to ensure that there was always an expert in the room when I was relaying any information. So I was often simplifying what I was hearing, but I kept um, an expert with me so that if I oversimplified to the point that it was no longer correct, he could pick me up on that. I'm a volcanologist, but uh, as a senior scientist here, I was heavily involved in the Kaikoura earthquake response as well, and I worked directly with communications and operations people at, at NEMA and with Norm during that earthquake response, and also in previous eruptions with NEMA, I've worked on the 
uh, Tongariro eruption at Tamari as well. All of these things build up uh, trust and understanding, which is critical to clear science communication and the use of that science in the, those key decisions. For Fakari, White Island uh, eruption, we had scientists embedded with us that were informing us about what, what the volcano was doing, what was the activity going on uh, at the time, how were some of the instrumentation that they had on the island, but also able to access remotely, how could that inform the thinking about um, the actions being taken, looking at informing um, when the rescue could take place, of being able to return to the island, all of those factors become part of that science relationship. But it becomes broader than that. We had scientists um, embedded in Whakatane in the response there, but also here at the national level. That provided for um, a scientist to provide the regional public information from the science perspective. Our role isn't to uh, decide if it's safe or not safe but rather to provide uh, the best possible expert science advice and interpretation for people to make those decisions. So we were immediately uh, thrust into supporting both the Prime Minister and Cabinet and the senior uh, risk decision uh, officials at the Beehive around uh, understanding what had happened at the volcano, what the chance of a future eruption might be, and supporting those decisions around if and when they might decide to go to the island to, uh, to recover bodies uh, from, the, from the tragic eruption. We are running a 24-7 centre called the NGMC and that centre is manned 24-7. We collect data from a range of sensors around the country and, uh, and analyse them in real time. So basically we've got the capability of having eyes on what's going on um, on the volcanoes, on the earthquakes, on the tsunami around the country. 24-7. And we also have the analysts who are analysing the, the data in real time so that we can provide um, a fast and accurate information about natural hazards. There were a number of key pieces of information that we really needed to provide. The first one was the likelihood of um, the volcano erupting again over the next 24 hours because this had direct implication in terms of how risky it would be for the ground team to do their work on the ground. Um, so we had a full team working out the details, uh, working out the probabilities and then we would be looking at okay if this is a likelihood of something happening and we had people on the ground doing the recovery operation, what is the likelihood of those teams to be killed by the eruption? What we realised was decision makers were interested in the science behind the chance of an eruption and, and our internal staff risk assessment zones. And so we looked carefully through the data we were using and Juliet and I focused on uh, the tremor signal, which is the amount of ground shaking related to energy coming through the volcano. Uh, and, and plots of gas that we were sensing from, um, from our, our gas sensing flights near the island. And once we were able to put just those couple of plots in uh, next to the maps of, of, of risk zones, they were a clear way to show uh, how we understood what was going on under the volcano and how that linked to the chance that we were estimating of an eruption in the future. So we agreed at the request of police and central government that they could look at those numbers at, to help them make their decisions about going back for body recovery. Now those, those numbers and the maps associated that with that are quite technical and Juliet and I worked really closely over a matter of hours to about a day to get those maps together in a clear and succinct way so decision makers wouldn't have any uncertainty around what we were saying for what the risk zones are and what the chance of an eruption might be. The morning that um, the people went in to retrieve the bodies was very intense because obviously we hadn't made the decision as a group of scientists, but we had provided some key information that enabled the decision to be made. Um, the chance of fatality that morning during the mission was about 6%, which is quite a nerve-wracking three hours to spend hoping that the volcano doesn't erupt during that window. Post Pike River, one of the things that came out of the overall inquiries were around the need to have a subject expert to basically be present during the recovery operations or any kind of operations on the ground. So in the case of Pike River, it was people who knew about um, mining because it's, you've got rescue teams or recovery teams who are, could be military, could be police, but they may not know anything about mines. 
Likewise, they may not know anything about volcanoes. And, uh, and uh, so I think one of the main outcomes from the Pike River was to have this, what they call the guardian angel um, role, which is having a subject matter expert um, assisting with the recovery operations. And, uh, and so we, we provided that to, uh, to the operations in the means of, uh, of, of myself being on one of the, shop, one of the ships um, on the Wellington on the first day and in the police helicopter on the second day to do two things. Uh, the first one was to actually give the final update on the level of activity prior to deploying people on island. And the second, probably the most important one, was to um, pull the plug and call for uh, an immediate evacuation should, should there be any signs that anything was about to happen or was starting to happen. It was an intense week, so I think it was over four days altogether. And during that time, the decision was made to go and retrieve the bodies in a highly unstable situation. So we understood that the volcano had erupted and that it might erupt again. The experts had a really clear understanding of the probability of that and it was all about mitigating the risk that the people that went to retrieve the bodies would get hurt. So, very intense, long days, trying to work through all the different parts of the problem from the science point of view and obviously not being involved in the decision in any way to go in but being involved in providing information so the decision could be made. At the core of it, actually, science saves lives. We use the advice from scientists, researchers, to inform what we do, which might be around public education, um, the policies that we put in place during real emergencies to seek scientific advice about threats or about information to do with a, a hazard, but also about how we can think about um, the way that we apply science in a practical setting. I think this is a really good example of why you don't just need science, but you need New Zealand science. So the reason that we were able to contribute is because those GNS scientists understand that particular volcano in enormous detail. So it's not the sort of place where overseas knowledge would have been any use at all. And those people were on hand and able to come to the bunker and help. And so the science was critical. Do the public understand that? I think. GNS do a great job at putting out volcano alert level warnings and socialising hazards, especially earthquakes. Everyone understands GNET and the, um, the felt reports, the citizen science. There's a lot of public engagement with hazards, but we can always do better. And the more the public understand the level of risk and how to deal with that risk, the better.